everyone. Welcome to the Maker Mistaker podcast. I love having deep, eye-opening, and sometimes mind-bending discussions about life and personal development. My mission is to help us all live in integrity with our truth, overcoming fears, bad habits, and limiting beliefs so we can create the life we want. This is episode six, and today we're talking all about procrastination, the silent killer of dreams. I'm your host, Jeff Finley, and with me is George Coghill. Say hello, George. Hello. How's it going, George? How's your month been? Uh, it's been good, man. It's been busy. That is good. You working on some freelance work, like your illustration? Yep. Been doing, uh, work was a little slow over the holiday, and it picked up again, and that's been nice, and uh, I'm working on client stuff, and then I'm also doing some uh, personal projects and getting those in gear, some art stuff, and then um, started. I actually started up a... Uh, a daily writing habit as well over the past couple of weeks where yes. I just make sure I write for 15 minutes a day, whether, you know, it could be journaling, could be working on a blog post or a book or whatever, but I just wanted to start writing on a daily basis. So I've been doing that for the past few weeks too. That's awesome. Are you reading anything good currently? Um, good question. I, I think we should be talking about books more often on the podcast. I, um, I just finished a really interesting book, and I don't remember if I sent you, if I texted you with that title, but it was called The Happiness Hypothesis. Yes, The Happiness Hypothesis. Hmm. And I um, wasn't expecting much from it, but it, it turned out to be actually a really uh, interesting book. It was uh, diving into the historical um, aspects of happiness and, and satisfaction and pleasure and all these things from a philosophical and a biological and spiritual and religious and scientific perspective. It was really interesting. And they kind of like kind of broke down what, what he thinks the, you know, the secret to find happiness is, which was, you know, it, like I said, I, I was expecting it to be more self helpy and, you know, the typical things you see on blog posts like that. But it was really in depth. I was really kind of, I didn't like how it ended, but I really enjoyed mm. reading the book. Yeah, that sounds cool. Um, yeah, I'm currently reading, well, I actually just finished a book called Grow Up A Man's Guide to Masculine Emotional Intelligence. And th- that was actually really excellent. Um, like, I wasn't expecting a whole lot going into it. But it kind of picked up where No More Mr. Nice Guy and Way of the Superior Man left off. So if you're a fan of David Data or the No More Mr. Nice Guy stuff, this this one kind of takes that up and summarizes it more into like a, I guess, yeah, it, it summarizes it. But what I like about it is it kind of had this assumption that there's a spiritual aspect to life, whether you call it God or whatever you want to call it, that, that there is something that a man his working towards that's greater than himself that is his is his integrity you know and so he so he doesn't have to have dependency on women or dependency on systems or other things so it's like how to live like a truly integrated remarkable man so to speak so i got a lot out of that and and actually it kind of went along with the uh, steve pavlina stuff that i've been reading a lot lately with the whole truth love and power trinity of like you know aligning yourself with your truth following your love and using your and and cultivating your own personal power to have courage to overcome your fears and all this kind of stuff. So that is something that's really been up my alley this, this week. And it kind of went along with my, (laughs) my no coffee detox that I've been doing. So, um, this is like, this kind of goes back to our habits episode, but I stopped drinking coffee in January, uh, for 21 days. And then that was really tough at the beginning. And I had a lot of cravings and I relapsed once or twice in there, but I got out of it. And then when I started drinking coffee back up again in February, I really, really felt the effects of what caffeine does to my system. And so I really struggled with trying to do my work and then have and bring and introduce back in the habit of drinking coffee. I would feel crazy, you know, like um, completely anxious and, and like I couldn't turn off this turbocharge that I had just ingested. And well, so I, I, I was really feeling the effects. And so I I just kept getting this hunch that like, man, coffee is not good for me, man. I want to live more in my own organic rhythm rather than artificially injecting myself with rocket fuel. So I stay productive. Um, And and so like I and I try to drink coffee and then it like my body just rejects it almost. I just feel really horrible. And so lately I've been going no coffee, no coffee 
I had some over the weekend because I had a coffee meeting with someone, but I'm really seeing the potential of my life without caffeine. So I'm actually pretty excited about that. It's interesting you bring that up because I, um, I did a, uh, well, two, a, a few things on that topic. I'm still drinking coffee, but what I started doing about a week ago, I think it is, and it most, mostly because I just ran out, was I, because I, I cut out added sugar probably about, I don't know, a year and a half ago, I think, is when I started doing that. So I haven't been putting any added sugar in uh, anything. And I, but I did switch over on coffee to coconut palm sugar, which is supposed to have the, um, the glycemic index is low. So it doesn't spike your blood sugar levels, which is supposed to be, you know, one, at least one aspect of the negative parts of eating, uh, glucose. So. Yeah, I kind of that was kind of a cheat, and I always kind of knew it, but I was it was it's better than table sugar. But I ran out and didn't feel like going to spend the money on buying more. And I said, you know what? I think I'm gonna this is gonna be the, I'm gonna start my 30 days of no, um, you know, nothing in the coffee, just black coffee, totally. And um, so far, so good. It's, it's been, uh, you know, it just does. It, it, it's mostly just been the taste that's. That, I've noticed, but not anything mm-hmm. as far as like energy or going crazy. Now, when you mentioned, you know, the coffee thing, two like two things I popped in my head was I, I had I tried drinking some green tea one time, and I had uh, what they call tachycardia, which is common for people that drink. Some it's not common, but some people can drink green, green tea and have it. It's like your your heart beats super fast. And yeah. Yeah. So I was like, that's it. I mean, I, it sounds like you might have had a similar effect with the coffee, but. Um, but I, um, but on the sugar thing too, I, I know I, my birthday was a couple of weeks, I don't know, a couple of weeks ago, something like that, whatever, beginning of February. And, uh, met up with a friend who, he got me some kettle corn for my birthday. <laughs> so obviously he wasn't paying attention to my, uh, my di- dietary changes, but, uh, I decided to eat some of it just cause I was like, ah, you know, it's not going to kill me. And the same thing that I did over Christmas. Of them because you know I don't want to be rude, but what you mentioned with the coffee, man, I felt really bad after I ate sh- these things with sugar both times. I mean, like I got mm. bad, bad headaches. I got um, I don't know. It's just I just felt really weird and and didn't, I didn't. I mean, it was so within an hour after eating them that it was like almost no doubt that that's what it was. But yeah, um, but it's interesting when you you know like you were mentioning you know not or, or living more organically like. When you take away these um, these additives, you know, because you get so used to using them, like you said, you can't tell when you when you go away from them and come back. Like I remember when I used to smoke, and I would, you know, some some days you wouldn't get a cigarette in the morning if you're running late and you're headed to class, and you know you might have, I might not have, have, have I might not have had a cigarette for hours that day, and when I finally had one, I remember like getting lightheaded and like how spaced out I was. I was like. Wow, I, you don't realize that that's how you are all the time. <laughs> you know, when you're sm- smoking or drinking coffee or doing whatever with these stimulants. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for me, I mean, it was like I kind of recalibrated to more with, with tap to not having caffeine, and then when I put it back in my system, it was like like too much for me. You know, like I, you know, you build up the tolerance, and then when you go away from it, you it goes back down. You become a lightweight again. But yeah, I, what was the, the thing that I didn't like mostly about it was I was super, super hyper focused on like my task, which was good, right? Like I could sit for long periods of time. I started realizing, wow, coffee makes you not take breaks. It makes you, it, it actually inhibits the receptors that help make you feel sleepy. So it's like, or it inhibits the enzymes or whatever that, that do that. And then so you, don't really feel tired. Even if you, you're, even if your body is tired, you just feel like you have, you want to keep working. And so every, and also every little task that was on my to-do list felt super important. Every new idea that popped in my head felt really urgent and important. I had to get it done now. Didn't want to delay. And it also made me tolerate crappy work more off more like crappy work easier. So I'm like, well, that's why this is corporate America's drug of choice. You know, it's like the work sucks, but drink coffee and you'll forget about it. Right. <laughs> so it's an interesting, I mean, that's one of the, you know, we've talked about this before, but those trying stuff out like this for 30 days, man, it's really some of the stuff you don't realize it's quite eye opening, like how, 
how much some of these things really filter the experience you have of the world. You know what I mean? Yeah. And you don't even know if like you're an actually cranky person or you're just dealing (laughs) with like caffeine addiction, you know, who knows? So well, anyway, this podcast is not about coffee or caffeine, although we could probably do a whole podcast on that. But um, I want to talk about procrastination. That's why we're all here. Um, So recently, Coach.me decided to uh, ask me to coach people on procrastination, on helping them overcome procrastination. So I was like, I've never coached people on this. So how am I going to do it? I struggle. I know I struggle with it myself. So I figure if I can just relate to people on that level, I can help people get over it. So, and it's been very interesting to me. I've, you know, I've got probably over 50, 60 uh, procrastination coaching clients right now. And so I'm learning a ton about why these people struggle and why I struggle. And, And some of my solutions, they don't work on some of these other people. So like, well, just what is procrastination? I mean, you know what it feels like, but what 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 do you think it is, George? I mean, I know that you mentioned the I Procrastinate podcast a couple episodes ago, and I listened to a couple episodes in that, and it's really, really, really good. But what is procrastination for you? Hmm, that's a good question. Um, <laughs> I mean, uh, that's a good question. I, I guess, I mean, procrastination really... If, my perspective is putting off doing something and it's not like delaying it like, Oh, I need to, I'm going to do that later today because I have to do something right now. But it's like literally a psychological, like, like shying away from doing something. So you're like, well, I'll do it tomorrow. And then knowing that you're not going to actually do it tomorrow, you're just kind of putting something into this nebulous future so that you don't have to deal with it. So Mm -hmm. I think it's different. Like, like and he talks about that on that podcast too. But the, I mean, anything you read on procrastination talks about this. But it's not procrastinate because people get sometimes people don't understand some of these terms we t- we've t- we've discussed. I always find people misinterpreting the, the terminology, and I think procrastination is a big one because people are like, oh, I don't procrastinate, but it's like it's like putting something off or rescheduling it is a different thing than procrastination. It's not. It's not. It's a, there's a psychological thing behind it where you're you're avoiding something you know mm-hmm. right? yeah that's what my experience has showed me it's a it's a coping mechanism to kind of avoid some point. sort of uncomfortableness or pain or a fear whatever it is that you're avoiding you know you're you're kind of choosing to do what feels more entertaining or comfortable in the moment and that sort of feels good to you mm-hmm. at that time but what you're doing is avoiding either a task you didn't want to do in the first place or a task that seems too hard or you're unclear, you're uncertain on what needs to be done. And for whatever reason, you're avoiding something. And so, yeah, we talk about lots of things you do in the habits episode of what you do when you're avoiding something like smoking or, or uh, playing video games or something like that. But it seems like it, it, it is the silent killer of dreams. Wouldn't you say? Well, I mean, I, you know, the coping mechanism part of it is a great, way to put it. And I, I really think like I've been doing a lot of his procrastination was something that I used to deal with big time. And it's not like I don't still, but I'm way, I'm amazingly better at it than I used to be. And I think it was, there's like, you know, we'll talk about this later when we get into some more detail on resources or whatever, but um, a few things, you know, that podcast was a big one for me that helped because he's, you know, coming from a science based perspective, but I really, um, not to, to jump ahead on you, but I really feel like I've kind of, at least for myself, I've cracked the code on what the procrastination was all about. And once I understood what the root, because that's always been my, that's always my goal in any of this self-development stuff is figure out what the root is and rip the rip it out at the root and, and you know, putting uh, band-aids on it or, you know, temporary fixes isn't going to help it. So I want to figure out where is this stuff coming from and why, I'm, you know, I, I consider procrastination to be a symptom of a deeper problem. I don't think procrastination mm-hmm. is its own problem. I think it's got... It's it's a symptom of something else, and it's once you realize what the something else is and get rid of that, then all of a sudden, boom, you don't procrastinate anymore because you don't you don't. It's a it's a like you said, it's a mechanism, it's a coping device. So when you don't need to cope anymore, you don't need to. Your procrastination just disappears. It, it, it literally evaporates. Wow. Yeah. So no, let's jump ahead. What is the solution to procrastination? <laughs> well, <laughs> right. I, I don't know what the solution is, but for me, it was uh, perfectionism was the was the root cause. What was what like I, I I consider procrastination the evil henchman of 
uh, perfectionism mm -hmm. and uh, perfectionism. If I don't, if we, I don't know if we've ever really gone over that before, but just for the people that are listening, you know, cause I, I went over this with my mom to explain some things to her. Cause you know, you pick a lot of this stuff up from your family because you're around them so much. So I, I was talking to both my parents about this, but they were like, Oh, I'm not a perfectionist. You know, you know, look at my house. It's not, it's, it's a mess. And I'm like, nah, you don't have to be a, like super clean freak or, or, you know, be meticulous in every aspect of your life. A, perf a perfectionist uh, really is somebody who they identify a, a certain part of their, of their personality is identified with something in their life that they have to do perfect. And it may be, you know, in my case, or maybe your case, because you're also an artist, you know, it could be the artwork that you create, but it could also be keeping your house clean. That could be one of them. For me, it's not. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not too concerned about that stuff. But I did have hangups about, um, you know, the kind of output that I had or the work that I would produce. Yeah, that would be, you know, the the stuff that would be put out there that other people would see. And the idea behind the per the perfectionism is you basically don't want to get judged because you over identify with the artwork. And he talks about, and, and I really believe that this is what does at least again, maybe this is just for me, but uh, in the war of art, uh, Stephen Pressfield's the war of art. Um, when he talks about resistance, the more I did, cause I was like, what is, where is it? What's, what is resistance? Where is this coming from? He never really addresses it. And I, from all, from the reading and digging in and thinking about it, I really believe that this perfectionism is a, is a big part of it, at least. And for me, it's a, it's a huge part of it, but you get into basically trying to avoid the, you know, if you create something and I don't care if it's a, if you're just, if you're a carpenter and you're making a table, you know, it doesn't have to be artwork, but whatever it is that you do, if once you complete that project, then it has the ability to reflect back on you. So if you, and I think we've gone into the, you know, the fixed mindset versus the growth mindset concepts, but if you over identify with what you produce as opposed to, you know, if you consider who you are to be what you do, you know, what you make, you know, right. so your artwork or the output of whatever it is, um, then you're going to, if you over identify with that stuff, then you have a, and, and you're worried, you know, maybe you have some steam issues or self-confidence issues. But when you put out art, let's just say, I'll use myself for the example. If I wanted to create something with the perfectionist mindset, with this idea that what I create reflects back on who I am as a person, then there's a judgment that goes with when you put your artwork out there. And the judgment may even just be indifference. You, know, you get no response. So it may not even be negative necessarily, but mm -hmm. you, you have this fear of putting that stuff out there. So the, the, the defense, the coping mechanism or the defense mechanism is, to not even do it. So if you can avoid even creating it or finding excuses to put it off or to make the project more difficult so that it's got more moving parts that have to be completed before you, I have to do this and I have to learn how to do this. And then I have to learn this skill and this technique is something I'm going to need to use and blah, blah, blah. You find your way or you find yourself, uh, you know, digging a deeper hole just to avoid ever completing it so that you never have to actually say i this is done you know because when it's done then it can be judged and then if you are over identifying it with it you can be judged so you know at least from you know again I, I can only speak and say this works this this was the big eureka for me but when i started looking at it from that perspective and this isn't something that i came up with this comes from a few books and we'll, like i said we'll talk about those later but um when i when i read these things i'm like that that explains me i, I this was it was such an aha moment that i'm like well, that's why I'm not doing any of this stuff. And then once I, once I saw through the ruse, it was so much easier to realize that my, what my brain was up to. And I was like, okay, well, I, I just, I know that's just a, an unhealthy way of dealing with something that I'm, you know, trying to avoid. So I, 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 it was way easier for me to work past it after that. And, and I'm actually, I'm going to, I'm going to get off the soapbox and let you respond. Yeah. So perfectionism, that's something that I've dealt with, you know, in my, my history too, like and over identifying with the work, like especially whenever you're making something that comes from your heart, you know, if you don't have a thick skin or if you're not really prepared to take criticism, those are the things that you have the most fear of putting out in the world, the ones that are more true to your 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 identity. Like if you're just doing a job and maybe your your identity is kind of shifted onto like the company or whatever, you don't really get you don't really care as much about what people say because it's not coming directly from you, then it's like easier to, to do that work. And especially if you've got someone else bossing you around that's expecting you to do that work, it's easier to do it. 
and especially if you know you can get away with doing only like 80% of the job, you can, it's easier to do it. But for yourself, you don't want to let yourself down. And, and when you identify so hardcore with your, with your work, that fear of it has, or that, that, that assumption that it has to be really, really good in order for it to, to exist out there because you you identify with it. Just let's go back to when you were a kid. It's almost like you weren't loved unless you were doing something good or you couldn't do, you did, you, you got criticized for not getting good enough grades, for example, and you felt less than, or you didn't feel worthy enough if you weren't getting straight A's. And so it kind of develops this whole um, approval seeking pattern and you do work and then you hope that people will like it, then you feel valid. But if they don't like it, you feel less than. And if they don't care, you feel like you're not not being heard, if, you know, if you have the indifference response. And so I got a lot of positive feedback when I was a kid. So I kept making work and like I get I got complimented all the time. So I kept making work. I mean, that's the power of positive encouragement, especially for children. Um, but then when I got into my career, I, I really relied on that validation from external sources. So it's like part of the reason I was motivated to create was to get that compliment again, to get that validation. Like, And then I really internalized the idea that I'm worthless unless I'm creating something. What do you think about that, George? I mean, like, especially as an artist or a creator, you're like, well, that, and that gets into, and that's, this is another, this is a topic that I, it, we should probably talk about this you know, in between podcasts and, and pick up this as a topic because I can't find a lot of resources on, you know, they talk about like the, what, what you're talking about is what, what I'm getting at is um, the over identification with the work. And he, you know, they talk, he talks about in the war of art and, and a lot of these uh, perfectionism books talk about this as well. And I even emailed the author of the one book that I got a lot out of and she didn't even really have an answer for me. And, but I learned my question was what is defined over identify uh, over identification with the work and how to get, how to stop doing it? Because to some degree, it's like, I don't know, you do identify with what you do because it's like, Hey, this is, you know, I enjoy what I do so much. And I've, you know, ever since I was a kid, I'm like, I want, this is what I want to do and I'm doing it. And it's hard to, to know, like, this is a big part of me and, and who I am is, is to do these things, you know, uh, where, where, where does the unhealthy level of the over identification with the work come in? Because, you know, like you said, I mean, you mentioned earlier about um, the, you know, the attention or the, the, uh, I forget what the word you use, but um, the, uh, what was the word you used? It was an A word. Um, I can't, I can't remember. Okay. Well, you said it was a good word, but, you know, you said you got compliments or whatever from the, from your family that encouraged you. And I, I think that plays a big factor because, you know, I've talked to a buddy of mine about similar topics like this. And we came to this conclusion. That it seemed like a lot of what we, you know, especially creative people tend to do is you, you do things for the attention that you got because you, when you, you know, you, you might have brought up a great point where when you're younger, I, I have this, uh, I don't know if this is, an observation or just a, a thought that I had, but when you're younger, you get attention for things that are uncommon for a kid to do. But once you're older and you're, you can actually do them well, nobody cares anymore. You know, and it's like you had mentioned mm -hmm. getting used to that approval. The approval is the word you use. Oh, yeah. uh, you, you get used to getting that attention or that approval or those compliments because of these things. And when you're, you know, this, this taps into the fixed uh, mindset versus the growth mindset concept. but you know, because you, you tapped into this, like this attention for these, these things, you were, you know, a little more skilled at than other people at your age, you start going, well, I'm going to do more of that. You know, I'm gonna, I, I like that attention. I like being considered special or different or you, unique or better than other people at a certain ability or whatever. And, um, yeah, you know, so it's like those things, like you said, you get older, if the pond gets bigger and you, you're, you stay the same size. So you get about there and you realize, Holy shit, every, you know, the internet's like the perfect way to realize how, like, how much talent is out there and how many people are out there doing, you know, amazing things that you're like, wow, I thought, you know, I thought I was pushing myself hard and these guys are it's just, you know, it's, it's, it can be, yeah, it can be mind blowing. So it's like you, you're, you know, when you were impressive to the 10 people in your, in your immediate family or whatever, and then 
maybe in grade school or, or, you know, even into high school, you had a, you still had that small enough pond where you could stand out as being like, you know, I'm sure you were like, like I was like, you know, one of the people that everyone's like, Oh, he's one of the best artists in the class or whatever. Yeah. You're only competing with, or not, not that you were competing, but there's only 150 people with my high school in my, in my class. So it wasn't like there was a huge, you know, well, if you think about it, George, in high school, I mean, we're all seeking for an identity, you know, and if you're an right. artist, you like, oh, that's my identity. Like you, it's, you really, you really put it on as your, as you, I mean, as other, as other kids who were kind of smart and nerdy, you know, I was, I was on the, I was in the top, like, I don't know, 10% of my class academic wise. So I got called a nerd and stuff like that quite often by some, some of the kids who weren't very smart or weren't very good, you know, at, at school. I but, was too, and I, st- I still, I'm, I still am a nerd. So <laughs> yeah, right. Oh, I mean, people would definitely call me a nerd now um, if they knew everything, all the stuff that I, I read on a regular basis. But, uh, but, but like I felt some of the kids who didn't have anything to fall back on, their identity was the nerd or something like that, or their academics, and they they were made fun of for that. But like for me, I kind of sidestepped it by being the artist. Like so, I was considered valuable in some way. Like I had cool artwork. And um, people admired me and looked up to me. So while I wasn't a jock or or I wasn't a valedictorian or anything like that, it's like me, small little Jeff in in elementary school and middle school and high school was wanting to be accepted. And one of the things that got me the most acceptance was being an artist. So it's like to me, that felt like my identity. So from right then and there, it was like creating this false self of um, the artist persona. And then when you said you get into the big pond of the Internet and all of that, you start to feel like insignificant and you have to work harder and to to like be seen and get that validation again and to make your put your stamp out there so to speak so then the the stakes are higher so of course you procrastinate now because what you used to do isn't good enough anymore in your eyes and and if it's not yeah exactly that's a good point in your eyes and that's the whole of in, in from the perspective of the stuff i've read that's the whole idea behind this perfectionist um, route to the procrastination is that you're avoiding having to come to the realization, like I'm my talents or whatever is not at the level that I wish that they were. And if I don't actually create anything, I don't actually ever have to see that comparison made, you know, firsthand. So it's this, it's like I said, when I, when I started thinking about all this stuff, I was like, it was like the, just, you know, like it was like an Indiana Jones, like, you know, puzzle unlocked itself. And I was like, I was like, wow, I couldn't believe it. It, just, it was all the tumblers fell into place. And I'm like, I, I can totally see what's been going on. My, you know, cause when you read the, the, the case, I don't know if they're case studies, but just the examples that they put in these books and I read through them and I'm like, the, the two funny things are, I'm like, Oh yeah, this is like exactly what I do. And I never even really paid attention to how I was doing it. But now that someone pointed out, I'm like, that is exactly how I look at things. And then you find out in later on in the book, they're like, yeah, and this isn't normal. Like not everybody does this. And I, you know, that's one of the things that I think you and I probably both uh, speaking back to, you know, doing these little experiments is you realize that some, some of your, the stuff we go through is actually more common than you realize, but a lot of the stuff you might take for granted that everybody else struggles with or deals with or filters their perception through mm-hmm. is not normal, you know? So, and I think that's, you know, the perfectionist thing was, you know, because that's one of the things I get into the, with the procrastinate or the perfect, you know, I hate to switch topics and make this all about perfectionism, but I think that they're, I think they're so inextricably, inter- I, I really don't even they believe are. procrastination is a, as much of a problem. No, procrastination as, is the symptom. If you're procrastinating, there's a reason for it. It's like, it's like right. biting your nails. Like there's a reason for it. That's a, that's perfect. Right. Yeah. And so, so what is the solution for a perfectionist? Um, there's an, a, an awesome podcast episode by Sean West. Um, it's, he calls it the 90% rule, or I've talked to other people who like to go as low as the 80% rule, basically like just do 80% of your best work and you be happy with that and ship it. The most important thing is ship it. Like done is better than perfect. Well, you get into these, a lot of these things too, with like a lot of the success literature. And I'm sure from, you know, I, I, we talked about this on uh, outside the podcast, but the, <clears throat> excuse me, the Steve Pavlina stuff, I was you know, digging into some of his posts and he's in the, you know, so I'm sure you've been exposed to the idea of the, these success guys, but that they talk about failure being such a key to these things. And it's like, you need to have, you need to 
learn to work through these things. And that's one of the things going back to the childhood, you know, the, the attention you got of the approval as a kid from this, these talents, um, you know, we, that's one of the things to fix with a fixed mindset and the growth mindset come in where you don't, and I'm sure, you know, speaking, you know, as you mentioned earlier, being, you know, being the nerd, you know, quote unquote, as a kid, you learned for, I'm sure things came easy to you and you didn't learn to go to deal with setbacks and to work past these, you know, to struggle through. I mean, mm-hmm. I remember doing my homework on the, I do my homework on the bus to get before I got home and my, my, you know, my sister would always struggle with her homework, but my mom's like, yeah, you'd be done with your homework before you even got home. And I, you know, I didn't have to, I barely, I skated through skates through school when I was younger, but I, in, in, at the time you think, oh, this is awesome. Then I get older, I go, I didn't realize how to put, put myself to work. I just expect everything to be easy for me. And when it wasn't, I didn't know how to deal with it. And I think working, you know, that 80% rule is the same as idea that I, I've stumbled across different terminology of, you know, it's, it's embracing failure. It's like working through those things, learning to mm-hmm. face the failure and then still move on and not like let that thing devastate you or affect you personally. You know, that's, that's a big part of the procrastination too, is that you take, you can take the rejections or the criticism or a failure so personally that you just don't ever, you're like, nope, I got to put that off because I don't want to deal with how I'm going to perceive the, the, you know, the, the after effects of it. Yeah. Yeah. I think that is huge. The, um, the fear of failure and yeah, like Steve Pavlina and all these, like what you call them success guys, they do stress failure as basically the primary goal of, of, lear- of growth and learning, like try a bunch of stuff and use direct experience to, to learn. You grow the fastest, you have the most revelations, you'll understand that failure actually doesn't hurt as bad as you thought. Right. And so like the 80% or 90% rule is more like get used to putting out something that's not your best work and understand and then realize that it's not a big deal. Like you still accomplished mostly what you wanted people didn't care they weren't like counting on you to do 100 percent anyway your 80 percent is probably as good or better than a lot of other people's 90 percent as i mean if you're still comparing at this point but (laughs) but the, the thing is yeah like get used to putting stuff out there that may be kind of weak you know and i think that's a good helper for procrastination because it'll help you get over whatever challenges that are helping that are keeping you that are making you scared like you need to face those and and um, shipping something that may not be maybe less than perfect is a good way to identify what it is that you need to do to, that you need to get over fear wise. And it may not be as bad as you think, you know, maybe you don't get any rejection. And if you do get rejection, you'll learn how to tolerate it. You'll learn how to say it's not that big of a deal. I'm still here, you know. Well, I mean, all, I totally agree with all that stuff. And, and even to, you know, speaking of shipping, let's switch gears a little bit. I had a, a little insight over the weekend. I, I started up this habit. That I kind of had happened on its on its own, but um, I started cleaning, making sure my house was. I started doing a, a like a, I just, all it was was one hour of cleaning all week. Every Sunday, I decided I'm going to after I clean up the dishes from lunch, I'm just going to move right into cleaning the kitchen up, right? So then I'm going to you know mop, do a quick mop of the floor, mm-hmm. I've done everything, and then I was like, you know, well maybe I'll just do this too, and I'll do that, and I ended up like a couple weeks in a row. I'm like, well, I'm just cleaning the whole house, so it only takes like a couple, you know, two hours. Max and I realized like I'm not doing a good job, but you know what? A, a, a shitty job cleaning the house is better than no job cleaning the house. You know, and, and yeah, I there you go. That's I, awesome. I pick up on a little bit more, so I'm like, well, I'm just gonna clean up that table. And I got rid of this table that was collecting clutter this like this past weekend. And I'm like, you know what? If I wasn't cleaning the house up for the past few weekends. I would have never gotten rid of that table and getting rid of that table has now made my living room more uh, minimal and less distracting and all that. I just know less places to put, you know, mail and let stuff collect and stuff like that. So it was like this slow, you know, and that was, I had an idea for a blog post was how does a, how does a perfectionist clean their house? It's like, do a shitty job. Don't, don't worry about cleaning your house up, realizing that a, a clean house is a, let's just say it takes a year to clean your house and you just do a little bit of it every week and you have to maintain it on, on top of that. And I think on a creative side of things, it's the same thing where you, you have this, uh, this idea that you have to hit, you know, and I, and I read a post about this and also talked to a buddy, a musician friend who struggles with this exact, and I used to struggle with the same stuff too, but this idea that the longer you put it off, the bigger the result has to be for when you do do something. So, so if you procrastinate long enough, all of a sudden you've built up this thing like, okay, I've identified with being, let's say a musician. So my buddy's a musician. He's mm-hmm. identified with being a musician and a songwriter. 
he's put off like for two years now getting his album, his new album that he's been working on, you know, but he hasn't done it and he hasn't been putting out any, any songs or anything in the meantime, because he's been trying to get his, uh, you know, his recording studio, his home home studio built and all this stuff, which to me is procrastination, but you know, on a, te- on a technological level, but, uh, yeah. but you know, he, he, he even mentioned this and it just happened to coincide with an article that I had read where, you know, he's like, man, he's like, the longer I don't do this, the more I feel like this album has to kick ass, you know, and it, it's these expectations that he's building up because he hasn't put anything out. And it's and, and he identifies with that, you know, that talent or that ability or that skill. And um, I, I, I yeah. you know, going back to the 80 percent rule, I really think that's where this idea of not necessarily aiming for failure, but being like just aiming for 80 for 80%, getting stuff out there, being consistent. Cause not only are you going to, like you said, get over the fear, but you're going to get better while you do it. That's how you, you, you only improve by practice, no matter what it is. And by putting out 80%, it's going to be 81% the next time. And it's going to be 82% the time after that. So there's, you're, it's going to, you're going to get actually get worse if you don't put out something at 80% because the next time you put it out, if you wait a month, it's going to be at 79%. So there's a, there's, there's a big reason to, to, to procrastination can be um, detrimental on, on multiple, you know, on deeper levels than just like, okay, you're not getting anything done. Cause that's what a lot of people think. They're like, oh, well, I'm pretty productive. I'm like, no, it's not about, the, 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 you know, checking everything off your to do list. It's about what kind of, what kind of attitude do you bring to the, to these projects that you want to complete? Are you actually pumped to get them done and to move on to the next one? Or are you putting it off so that you don't have to worry about the, you know, mm-hmm. dealing with the aftermath of whatever you create because you're afraid of the, of the response or how it might, you know, if it might be negative or whatever it's, 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 uh, yeah. Yeah. So, man, so perfectionism, <laughs> that's one, one reason why we procrastinate, but so for what, what I'm no- noticing, from my clients is there's a few other reasons like some of them aren't perfectionists but i think the next thing i want to talk about is just the uncertainty of where to start they feel overwhelmed they feel like there's too many things they have to do and they don't know what they know that they have to do a lot of stuff but they don't know where to start and so the thing i always recommend to them is to identify their most important task their biggest goal their, their heart's desire what is, out of all the things list it all out what is the biggest thing that you want to get done and then make that your focus for the first thing you do every day when you sit down to work. And and that generally helps. It's like, oh, I can do that. Like, okay. And then if that project is too big, you know, we break it down into small steps. But like the uncertainty or the lack of clarity, because they're trying to hold on all these to do's in their mind, in their head, and all these obligations, mostly that's kind of what they are. They're obligations. I wouldn't even call them desires. <laughs> <laughs> they're like things they have to do, errands and tasks and you know, like their to do list basically. I don't know if I'm following you on that. How do they, um, how does the to-do list come into the, uh, the procrastination? Well, they've they've got a mental to-do list. It's like all these things they know they have to get done. You know, they look around their house, it's full of clutter and they know they've got like, they're trying to get a new job. So they got to like send out resumes, but then the house is a mess and like, oh, well, I got to go to the grocery store. Oh, and there's that side project that I wanted to do. Or yeah, I got a guitar sitting there. I never practice. Every time I walk by it, I feel like I should do that, but nothing ever gets done. Like they don't start on anything. Right. And that, that's, you know, that touches back to something we talked about and I forget what podcast it was, but, um, you know, that whole idea of, I think it was, it was the habit one where it's like, you know, and in touching back to that, you know, my story about, that I just mentioned about cleaning the house where if you can chain things together where you're like, like you said, you get up in the morning and you do the first thing first. And it's like, you know, like I mentioned, make your bed in the morning. And then after you make your bed, you know, for me, it's like make the bed meditate after after that and then chain these things together so that you're not making like because that's one of the things that i started realizing in the morning that i'm, I'm sure you've stumbled across the idea of writing down um, and this comes from uh, brian tracy who has, has some really interesting self-development business kind of stuff but uh he has this thing where he says write down the list of things you need to do the night before you know you write down tomorrow's list today tonight mm-hmm and I realized the other, the other day that what, what you know, we, we, I don't know, we've talked on, um, you know, the biological aspects of willpower. Well, willpower will actually deplete throughout the day. And the more you use it for things like making any decision, <clears throat> excuse me, even if it's 
what you know, what pants to wear or whatever, all those little things whittle away your, your willpower. So the idea to to put this list of what you need to do, get it together the night before. So you, you already, you, you know, that list you're taught, you're telling your clients, they don't need to make that decision in the morning when their willpower is the strongest. They know exactly what that first task is. They know what to do right after it. You know, they know exactly what to do in the order to do it in. Yeah. And that's a huge part of it because you can get bogged down in this, you know, which one's next, you know, cause there's, we've talked about this before, the whole idea of like, you can spend an hour, you can spend a whole day, you can spend a whole week organizing your to-do list, you know, and that's where another form of procrastination is to avoid actually doing anything. I think, <clears throat> I think having, um, having a game plan is a big thing and having chaining these habits together, you know, I'm going to do this. I'm going to, you know, tomorrow I'm going to wake up. I'm going to do this. I'm going to brush my teeth. I'm going to make the bed and then I'm going to write for 15 minutes. You know, that's what I, that's how I started writing for 15 minutes for these past weeks. Cause I've been putting that off uh, and procrastinating. And for a lot of the reasons we've talked about, you know, and I decided, you know, what I got, I got time in the morning and the morning is when I most, I don't know. I, I, I often write emails to people and I realize, man, I've just written like this eight page email that could have been a, a chapter in a book that I literally could have written, a, you know, a book in a month if I would have stopped and, and disciplined myself for that. So that's actually what I'm doing now, you know, yeah. writing every morning. Yeah. And I, what you said about creating that to-do list the night before, it's the mental thing behind it is really setting that firm intention to do something. So you're getting your, it's like you're putting your car in drive, you know, like, and you're not just sitting there in park, like wondering what you're going to do. Like, I got to do that someday. Like, like that, that's feeling doesn't get you anywhere. But then when you start to say, okay, here's what I'm going to do tomorrow, I will. And then you, right. even if you, even if you're not even writing it down, like I've been doing this right before bed, I'll turn the light off before I crawl into bed, I'll stand there. And I'll get in touch with myself and I say like, okay, what is it that I'm going to do tomorrow? Like my intention, I'm going to wake up at 7 a.m. I'm going to go directly into the shower or, you know, write down my dreams. And then I'm going to go downstairs and meditate and listen to my audio book. And just like, I'll just mentally kind of plan it out. And when I wake up, it's like fresh in my mind. Okay, I know exactly what to do. I don't have to even think about it because I already decided what I'm going to do. All I have to do is carry it out. And that's a lot easier to do than man, I really need to like get up this morning. What am I going to do today? I don't know. Um, I just go back to sleep. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, it's, it's, there's a huge uh, benefit for, for planning this stuff. Like that's the thing too, is a lot of people, you know, they think, well, I'm not that kind of a person. And I'll tell you what you, you can totally back me up on this. The more you do this stuff, the more you become that kind of, because that's really what I think the goal is. The goal isn't to accomplish any of these goals that you have on your, on your goal list or your to-do list or whatever. The goal is to become a person that likes to complete tasks. If you can make yourself into that person, everything else will take care of itself. So you do that again by practice and repetition and by doing this every day. So you have to, I read a good uh, quote there. They said uh, self-discipline is, doing what you know you have to do even when you don't feel like it. And I think that's the perfect example is of a way to get past some of this procrastination stuff by using a routine is that like I went through a little bit of a, I wouldn't really call it depression, but I could, you know, I'm sure you're on the same boat where you can tell, you know, now when a depression is, has the potential to kick in, you know, you can feel it coming in, coming out. It's almost like a little bit of a cold. And <laughs> yeah, you know, you know what I'm saying? So you can feel when your mood's in a little spot. So you go like, oh, I got to be careful now. And you got to do certain things. And that rumination is one of the things you don't want to do. And I, what I found is last time when I went through this was that I was like, man, this routine that I have, right? You know, wake up, do this, right? Meditate, whatever, blah, blah, blah. You know, going through that and then have, you know, and it, it really continues through my whole day because I try to get a hike in every day and I do exercise and, and whatever and prepare food and stuff like that. So it's like, that routine really helps me kind of get through the, um, you know, these little emotional lows that can derail you, derail you from, you know, or get you into a, a procrastination mindset where you're like, I'll just do that tomorrow. So I don't feel like it. And that's the one thing I think these routines and having these things written out, especially the day before, while you, you know, before you're uh, to allow your willpower in the morning to be, to, to get, use that willpower to get that first thing done, not to decide what 18 things you're going to do. Like 
make that thing happen and, and use your willpower for that. But, um, but that's really where you get, you can get past some of these blocks about what to do next is like, get these things scheduled out. And the more you do them, you'll become like, now I become a person where I'm like, and I never used to be this way. And I'm like, yeah, I'd rather just be doing something. Or I want to be working on something. I feel weird when I don't do it now. And it's, it's, it's some of it's a little bit, you know, we, we've joked in the past how I'm, you know, <laughs> the more the drill sergeant about this stuff, but I think you, mm-hmm. you do have to put yourself through a bit of a boot camp to, to at least at the outset, like you don't, it's not like you, you're going to have to kick your ass every, every day to do this stuff, but you might have to do that for 21 days or for 60 days. It may be a period of time where you have to realize that you're, you're trying to break some pretty deeply ingrained habits, but you can make new ones that are equally ingrained by choice. It's just going to take some work, you know? Yeah. And this ties into the truth, love and power thing that I've been learning a lot about. So what George is talking about is a lot of the power aspect, the taking action and but it, where it combines with truth and love is this is where you decide what is, what is it that I'm doing that really resonates with me? Like the, the things that I'm doing, how do you identify what you should be doing versus what you must be doing? You know, the things that are really important to you, like you've got a whole bunch of tasks, you can put them all on a to-do list and drill sergeant yourself into doing all of them or build a, hab- a habitual routine and do all these things. But are you really doing the most effective things for yourself? Like, you know, um, that's where I think you got it work on the truth aspect where you start to really know what you are all about. What is it that your, your soul is trying to express, you know, and then where are all of your limiting beliefs and where are your fears and all this kind of stuff. And the love aspect is really combining the love aspect with power means you are choosing to do things that, that resonate with your, with your core being. And those are the things that you have a lot more less friction on doing like, you know, say I want to learn guitar, but like I'm only learning guitar for like reasons that I'm basically like, I want to be good at something. I'm going to try guitar. Maybe if you're not, if it doesn't really resonate with you, then you're going to have a harder time getting going. But like, or saying like, I really need to do some, the pull the weeds in the garden or do some yard work. But like, if you're not really that kind of a person, um, it's going to be harder for you to do it. Like, so I find you got to find the things that really resonate with you. And some, some of the things on your to-do list are probably things you would be better off getting rid of rather than trying to muscle through them. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I'm not saying that you should do everything on your to-do list and muscle through everything that's on there. What I'm saying is when you do, when you know what you want to do, you know, for me, it's like, I want to, you know, finish these 10 paintings. Well, to me that you can't just, I can't wait till I know, what if they resonate with my core being? I have to say, no, I just have to sit down and work. I mean, it's really not a matter of having to figure anything out. It's more a matter of sitting your ass down and making something happen. Because I think a lot of people, again, I think you can get tied up in procrastination with trying to figure things out or to, you know, make sure everything's perfect before you get started. And I think that, again, touching right. back to the 80% rule, you've got to be careful of that stuff that you're not making. Um, you're just not, you know, you're not making excuses. You're not delaying or you're not procrastinating stuff just because it, it, that's the one thing about procrastination, man, is that it, it's like the shapeshifter from hell. It is <laughs> amazing. Like you can be doing things like I'll catch myself. I'll catch myself being uh, like I did my taxes to avoid doing some, something else. And I'm like, so you can actually be productive by and be procrastinating. You know what I mean? Like, so you, even though I got oh, yeah. my taxes partially prepped a couple weekends ago, I was actually do, using that to procrastinate and doing something else that I didn't yeah. really want to do at the time. So it's like you may be productive and still be procrastinating. So it's you got that's like to me the idea is to try again. I, I like to try to dig in and find the root. So you know, for me, I'm like, yeah, there's something else going on here. But I tell you what, the, speaking to the you know the, to finding what resonates with you. I think procrastination is a huge, that, that can be a huge uh, signpost. You know I mean? If you're, if you're, if there's something that's causing you to have these anxieties or to have, you know, you have these reservations about completing something, it may be something that kind of is pointing you in the right direction. Like this is something you got to deal with. This is something that 
is important to you, but you're obviously, you're, you know, you're not putting, a lot of things you're putting off is because they are important to you, not because they're frivolous. You know, you want to do yeah. these little easy, I'll clean the garden, weed the garden, because that's a easy task. You know what has to be done. There's no question about it. It doesn't affect you as a person, whether you do it or not. So it's like the, the procrastination anxieties can can point to point you in a good direction, I think. I think they can be a guide. Yeah, I think well, I guess what I'm getting at is some of my clients will give me a whole list of things they they have on the, on their mind. And most of them are things that were assigned to them or someone else wanted them to do. They don't feel like doing it. They don't like their job. But that what they really want to do is like they want to like start their own business or they want to like, become, you know, put out their album. But, you know, they have no problem writing music, but then they are procrastinating at work, you know, or something like that. And that's where it, it gets tough because it's like. On one hand, I have this idealistic notion that like, I feel like everyone should be living their purpose and every task that they do should be working them towards right. their authentic truth and all of this kind of stuff. But like, the fact of the matter is we all have things on our to-do list that are usually obligations that are put on there, but not by somebody else. Like we would agree to do something for someone or we agree to do the hard work. You know, we know the lawn needs mowed, right? We got to mow the lawn. And at some point we decided we're going to buy a house or with a lawn that needs mowed. So and what what how i end up like tricking myself into getting these into getting going so this is i guess we can transition into how to do some of these tasks like what are some of the tricks that we do to get ourselves to do the things that we know we need to but we just don't feel like it so one of the things i do especially when i'm doing chores or yard work is i will use that as an opportunity to listen to an audiobook so i will like try to be pro productive or make it more enjoyable more aligned with myself by multitasking or like doing a left brain, right brain type thing, like pulling the weeds while I'm listening to a podcast or something like that. Or, you know, that, those are the kind of things I like to do. Yeah, I don't know what, um, well, I mean, to, to be honest for me, it was like, it was digging deep and finding that, you know, at least, like I said, for myself, that, that perfectionist root and going, Oh, I know what I'm up to now. So, I can feel it coming up. I know that I just need to work because that's one of the things too, that I find is, I don't know if we talked about this before, but it's like, I've, you know, that's the five minute rule, sit down and do it for five minutes because eventually your brain is just going to go, okay, I'm into this now. Like you, if you don't, if you didn't want to do it and you do it for five minutes, your brain will go, okay, I'm in. And, and it doesn't yeah. take long to switch over. You know, it's like, it's like going for a hike. If you, sometimes you don't want to go for a walk or, get on the bike and you're like, ah, maybe I'll just do it tomorrow. But if you get out and actually just say, I'm you know, going to do it for five minutes, then you're like, I know I don't want to go come back. You know, I don't want to go home. I don't want to cut short. So it's, yeah, that's the, that's the hardest part is getting started. You know, that's where the whole inertia thing comes into play. And they, and that, that pod that I procrastinate podcast, that's one of his, uh, his, you know, phrases or whatever on there is just get started because it's the whole idea is just put it into motion. And if you do that, that's what, that's, that's like, I mean, that is really 99% of the problem is, is that, is that, uh, is the getting started part and just to sit down and do it. Cause like, again, like, like I was touching on earlier, if you can cultivate the personality in yourself that you're a person who just gets started on something and you just know, like, cause I, I do it all the time now and I don't even have to, I, I'm getting better and better at not having to think about it. So that's the, I mean, the, the trick is to, is to, and, and when I say, you know, drill sergeant or whatever, I'm kind of joking around. It's really just a matter of like, it's more to that lazy part of your brain that goes, well, I'm just going to sit. I just want the immediate gratification. I'm going to sit, watch another episode of uh, whatever on Netflix. You got to train yourself to say no to that stuff. And then what you said earlier too, about rewards, that's a good way to do it too. That's one of the things I've been doing to myself is, okay, I do want to watch something. You know, I had a movie I wanted to watch the other day. So I'm like, I am going to watch the movie, but I'm only if I work for a half an hour on my paintings. So I ended up working for an hour and a half on the paintings, but the whole, and I still watch the movie afterwards. But the idea was find, um, find a, if you do want to do something to procrastinate with, make that the reward for doing the thing you're procrastinating on. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, and like you said, just do it for five minutes or whatever. Like, all you got to do is get started and then and then you'll find yourself like getting into it. And, right. Yeah. We talked. I think I talked about that with Gigi on my first episode when we talked about resistance. And I was trying to ask her, like, how do you know? How could you discern like what the resistance is? Because is it 
because I would always have a hang up like, is this the right thing I should be doing? You know, like, should I be wasting my time on this thing or is it or am I just facing resistance? You know, that that hard part of getting started. And it's really it's most of the time the hard part of getting started. If you think about like trying to, you know, push a rock, you know, it's really hard or push something heavy. It's it takes a while to get it started. But then once it gets going, it's just it, it's got a lot of momentum and it's easy to keep going. And then you don't want to stop it. So it's 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 very much like that, except for the psychological version. Well, you know, uh, speaking of, uh, you know, what should I should I be doing in doing this? You know, I, that that, um, that raptitude blog that I mentioned last, oh, I think I mentioned that on yeah, the last podcast. I definitely told you about it, but um, been reading more of that guy's stuff, and he had a good um, he had a good essay on there, a post where he talked about whatever it is that you should be doing. You will not know it until you actually experience it firsthand. So even if you do have these self-doubts of like, I don't know if this is the right thing or maybe I'm just wasting my time, do them anyways. Because there obviously something about it compels you to think that you should do it. So maybe it's not what you should be doing, but you won't know that until you do it and actually follow it through to the end. And I'm not saying like you have to become, you know, if you want to be a musician, you have to like become super famous and rich musician you may it may just be a matter of sorry um you know finish writing some songs following through to put an album out and blah 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 and try to get that sold you might go through the whole process and go yeah I, just, I don't i don't dig this at all this is i mean i like playing guitar but i don't you know i play guitar i, I started practicing again on a daily basis a couple of weeks ago but or a couple of months ago but um you know i have no interest in in recording music and all that you know I, mean, I already know that about myself i just like to goof around with it that's that's more interesting to me just mm-hmm. to play so but i wouldn't know but i was in a band years ago and i did play with other people and we did record and i, I went through that whole thing and i'm like yep that's not, that's not for me so but i wouldn't have i would have always had that thing in the back of my head like well maybe i should be doing this uh, and you may not know that until you go through with it so all those little i mean and again you got to watch you do got to be careful but uh you know tonight you know death by a million paper cuts kind of concept but if there is something that you're like think you should do you should like set a schedule for yourself and do it work through it and make it you know get some of those things done because you may not you may you may not know it's not for you until you do it for and have that firsthand experience i really think that guy was on something with that post no i totally agree because if something is compelling you to do something especially if it's coming from yourself um by trying it, you may not like that, but it might turn you on to something different, you know? That too. And and also, like, when you said when you procrastinate, the work that you're doing when you procrastinate is, all, is sometimes productive. You know, for example, like, I should have been doing um, writing in my book, but I didn't want to, and I ended up redesigning my website. <laughs> right. <laughs> and I did, I got a, I got a new website design on makermistaker.com. So, I mean, it's a brand new theme and I mean, it looks cool and I was inspired to do it. I'm like, okay, I think that also had a lot to do with the coffee because I had the idea and I'm like, I better do it now. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I did, I don't like, I, it's amazing because I got it done in just like two days. But if I like, sometimes if I decided I got to redesign my website, and I start thinking about it and I put it on my to-do list and I like, okay, today's the day. It's like, it doesn't happen. You know, it's like the, I showed up and the muse wasn't there or something like that. Well, but then, tricky, uh, <laughs> yeah. oh, go ahead. I'm just saying, and then of course the time I'm trying to struggle doing something I should be doing that I've assigned myself that I know is important, like my book, um, which is the thing I procrastinate the most on. Well, you know, big surprise. Um, but then I find the inspiration to redesign my website when I'm trying to avoid doing that. And it's, it's, I mean, I do the same exact thing. And one of the things that I've noticed in myself it is it, touching back a little bit on this depression thing is like, <laughs> maybe I have manic depression because I do notice that I, I go through these periods where it's almost like your coffee fueled frenzy of, you know, getting shit done. <laughs> yeah. But I'll go through the same thing without, I mean, I drink coffee, but I don't, I drink, you know, two cups in the morning and that's it. But I don't, I don't, I actually don't feel like it does anything to me, but it probably does. I just don't notice it. But I, I go through these, these, these periods are more like larger cycles. You know, every couple of months I'll go, I'll get into this thing. And I, I told my brother, I go, I got this problem where I get really motivated to do stuff and I'll get motivated 
and I'll be like, oh, I got this idea for an app. And I mean, I'm not talking about anything related to artwork or what I normally do on a day to day or the, the actual goals I'm trying to accomplish that I know that I want to do. These are things like, oh, I have, you know, the other day I had this idea for a, for, you know, like a long form communication uh, app and, and I'll get wrapped up in these ideas and I'll spend like a half a day, like writing down ideas and researching things. And I'm like, what am I doing? I'm totally, this is, I'm never going to do, this is never going to go anywhere. Why am I spending all this time? I <laughs> yeah. get this manic energy where I'm like, and I really, I feel like, like the neurons in my brain have been like greased with, you know, super conductivity, uh, fluids or something. Cause it's like, I feel like my, you know, I just feel super creative. I feel like ideas are coming in, you know, it's, 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 it's probably when people feel like when they're on cocaine, I've never done it, but that's, <laughs> that's what that's, the descriptions I've read sound like that, but it's really, you know, it's not even like I'm inspired. I'm like, no, all of these things are cool. I'm going to do this and I'm going to email this guy and I'm going to direct message that guy. We're going to get this thing going. I'm going to put this in the back burner. We're going to make this happen. And it's like, you know, then I have like this, almost like this productivity hangover a couple of days later. I'm like, oh man, I made a bunch of promises. I'm never going to follow through on, you know, and I didn't even do all the things that I was working on. So it's like, yeah, you know, it's, it's dangerous. Like, again, it can be, those things can, you can be productively procrastinating, you know, a productive, a productive procrastinator. I don't know how to put that, but yeah, Jessica Hish has a page on her website. She calls herself a procrasta worker. And she's got a whole page of all the projects that she does that were procrastination projects that ended up being some of her most popular achievements. <laughs> you know, some of the things that really changed people's lives, you know, some of her most inspiring projects were those like, oh, yeah, I got an awesome idea. Oh, yeah, you can, let's, let's do it tonight. But that's and, a good and that's a good point, though, because think about a lot of these things we procrastinate on is because we have this big hang up about, oh, it's going to be perfect and oh, it's got to be great. But it's like those ones almost like the the procrasti productive procrastination product projects or whatever they're almost like like well i'm just gonna get it done real quick and then you don't get hung up on the details you get it done and then you actually work to that 80 percent get it done and it actually comes out probably at 90 percent and you didn't you know belabor the whole thing and you it, yeah. it, it, maybe the true part of you actually did come out in doing that because you didn't have time to get it all hung up with your preconceived you know what i mean there's it's you 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 you, you circumvented that whole process no, so you were like you were like getting like a high dose of inspiration energy and like that's where you get that intense drive to put something out and if you don't act on it then it just gets reabsorbed somewhere you know that energy <laughs> goes somewhere it kind of reabsorbed back into the into your body into the universe or wherever it came from you know it's like you know, and you're back down to reality. But like those little moments, those sparks, there's well, a book that my friend Josh Long wrote called Execute. And he talks all about that. And he says, like, execute now. He wrote that book in, in eight days and shipped it. Well, the, the, in, in speaking of that, though, that's a good thing to, to, to mention about all this stuff, too, is that you got to find for yourself. You know, and like I mentioned earlier, I've been procrastinating on doing this daily write or regular writing and I chose to make it daily. But I, when I realized, I'm like, wait a minute, for some reason, the early morning and I, because I have the flexibility and schedule to do this, I'm like, that's when I should be writing. I don't get any artwork done in the morning. I don't like to work. I, I like to do business stuff in the morning if I have to. I, I like to do all that crap and get it. I like to work on the creative stuff at night or in the afternoon. Yeah. But the writing stuff, I'm like, wait a minute, I'm really on when I write in the morning. Like I said, I would write emails or, or you know, message board posts, whatever and I would go do these in the morning and they would be very involved. I felt very inspired by it. And I'm like, wait a minute, this energy needs to be refocused to a project, you know, cause I have writing projects that I want to work on. So, you know, speaking of uh, tips and tools, that's one thing to do is to notice your personal, you know, I don't, like you said, whenever the muse is kicked in or what, I forget what word you use. Yeah, but exactly. That's exactly it. Notice that in yourself, find those day, those times and figure out a way to make that, um, you know, to, to put that to use, because if you're already, you know, like you said, if you're, if, you, if that, if that energy comes up and it goes somewhere, if you don't use it, notice when that happens. Cause it, I mean, can you agree with me that it happens for you relatively, you know, at the same time of day, like, cause you're a morning person now, but you know, when it's, when your good time is, mm -hmm. you can make that is like, okay, that's the time I'm going to work on this project. I'm going to put this in the schedule that, at that specific time. Cause I can feel like, that's my time to, to write or, or play guitar or whatever. Yeah, that works for me too. I, I write best in the morning and I've noticed a couple of other authors and creators 
say the same thing. Like the mornings are a really good time for writing and and sort of creative thinking work, like tasks that require your brain to think a lot. And then midday is good for like production work where you can put on some tunes and just work on like a drawing or something like that. Mm-hmm. I think that's or like any sort of productive task that requires you to just kind of crank it out. Right. Um, but if it's if it's critical thinking work, morning is your best time. I mean, if you're fresh eyes, you don't have any distractions. And gosh, I mean, the whole distraction thing is a huge, a huge thing for procrastination. The more distractions you can, or yeah, the more distractions you can eliminate, then the, you're just setting yourself up for better, for more success. The, the, the more pure you can make your environment. Yeah, I mean that's that could po- also probably be another. I guess I, get, I do have some more. It's interesting we talk about this because I forget about all the things that I've done over the past. Because I did, I accumulated these things over the you know over a year and a half. Yeah, and I don't think about them. I didn't actually sit down and go, "Oh, I'm going to do this." But you know, some of the and I think we've talked about this. I'm sure I'm, it was all, to me a lot of this stuff all overlaps uh, with other you know habit forming and all that kind of stuff. But you know, I turned you know speaking of distractions, you know, social media, keeping like a Twitter app going while you're trying to get something done. That's just the dumbest thing ever, you know, having yeah. a Facebook page open in your browser to hop back and forth when you get bored. Those are things that are huge procrastination uh, uh, magnets. You know what I mean? I, I, I turned off all the alarms on my phone except for the ringer and the text message thing. And it's the only thing that makes a noise yeah. and, and, you know, alar- alarms for things. But, yeah. you know, no more beeps and boops for stupid, you know, social media stuff or, or, or your email. Oh yeah. Close that email when you're working on something. I mean, some people, I don't do this, but some people I've turned my email to only automatically check every hour. And some people turn their, or quit their email program and only check it uh, four times a day. That's it. They didn't, they tell their clients like, look, I'm going to check my email at nine in the morning. I'll check it at, you know, whatever, whatever their four hours are. They're like, this is when I check it. So if you need to get a hold of me, send it before one of those times. And, um, I, if it, depending on how bad it is for you, I'm sure that would, that's a, you know, that's a very valid thing to look into. Cause I mean, you, you know, going back to that willpower stuff, doing stuff in the morning or doing that first thing is like your willpower gets depleted and those little beeps and those urges to look that depletes the willpower too. It's like, cause you're like, you have to make a decision not to do it cause you always don't do it. And then you do it late, you end up doing it. You know what I mean? So you, you're you're slowly eroding your willpower every time you make a. Uh, I'll just no, I'm not going to check Facebook now. And then ten minutes later, you're on Facebook. So it's like you just depleted willpower, and it didn't even do you any good because you went on. You did that thing you were being tempted on to do anyway. So yeah, and you didn't you didn't even need to have that opportunity to even think about it if you just got rid of the distraction because someone of it is is triggered by something by a notification. Or some well, some hook that implants like the urge into our mind. Then we have to use willpower to say no to it. And then the more we do that during the day, the, the harder it gets. Right. And there's 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 software you can get for Mac and PC that will block websites during the day. Like you can sp- set it up like, um, you know, don't let me go to Facebook.com and or any link that starts with Facebook.com. And you just set it up so it doesn't even your computer won't do that from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. So that you can make sure that you are fail, holding yourself accountable. You know what I mean? So yeah. Those, those are little tools that, that are, that you can use to kind of, I, there was an episode on the I procrastinate podcast. They had a, a term for those tools. I forget what they called it, but what the app, the, the extension I like to use is called stay focused. It's for Chrome and it, it automatically has a selection of websites that it kind of knows are bad. <laughs> <laughs> and then you can just use those default settings if you want, but you can set a time limit so say 10 minutes per day on Facebook is your limit. So then it kind of keeps track uh-huh. every single time you visit the website, there's a little timer that's telling you how much time you have left. And, but it's still, even that is enough of a distraction, like 10 minutes, that's enough to derail your focus on a project. And then you have to get the inertia to start up again. And it's just like an unnecessary, completely unnecessary. You don't need to be doing that. Plus your, your urge to check Facebook is also another symptom. If you're constantly doing it to it, you're avoiding some the uncomfortable task or the avoiding the boredom of a, of a progress bar or of a loading thing you're trying to like open up a new tab and check facebook dangerous stuff if you're trying to like overcome procrastination get rid of all of those um and don't only check those at a certain time during the day if you're going to you know just not when you're trying to get important work done 
Right. And the, and the thing too, that, you know, I mean, you may just made me think of something is when I refer to things as like the drill sergeant or the boot camp, what I really actually do is I make it more like a game for myself. That's really what's going on is I'm like challenging myself to go, you know what? I'm just going to not check. I'm just not going to go on. Cause that's how I start. I didn't intend to kind of disappear from social media, but it ended up happening because I said, I'm just not going to do it for a week. This one week, I'm just going to see, I'm just going to tell myself I'm not going to do it for a week. And then I did it after, after two days, I was like, well, I got so much done and I, my brain actually felt better. I felt like I was thinking more clearly. Mm-hmm. I wasn't chopped up in, in, uh, you know, these old chopping my experience up for into tweet size, you know, morsels or whatever. So it's like, yeah, I just continued to do it because it felt better. And I think you can do the same thing. And, and, and this will happen when you start accomplishing stuff is you, you might have to make it a little game for yourself, but you will actually enjoy the feeling of accomplishing these things or saying no, like it'll feel good to go. No, nope, I'm not going to do that because you have some self-control and some, some self-sovereignty you have. Uh, there's this thing that I'm, uh, I've heard of in the past, but I'm getting back into the idea. I just like to, the phrase is, is a good one. It's called the inner, inner, yeah, inner locus of control. And the word locus just means a point, you know, a position. But the idea is that, the control comes from you, not from, oh, I got to resist Facebook. It's like, no, I ch- I'm going to choose to use Facebook or I'm going to choose not to. And it's like when you start establishing those things, it feels good. Like it, it, you'll you'll overcome procrastination by making these small decisions throughout your day as much as possible because mm-hmm. it's like a muscle. And you'll you'll like you won't need to like you'll overcome procrastination by yourself without like despite yourself sometimes like even. Like last night I was working on something I'm like, eh, I'm not going to do I'm like eh, my brain, like my subconscious mind or whatever is like on this thing now where he, it was like, nope, we're going to go work on this thing and you're not going to sit and watch TV. And I just, it just, you know, you know what I mean? It was like almost like autopilot, which was really super cool. Cause That's I was awesome. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, 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 there's a lot of, um, you know, establishing these habits. And that's a huge part of a lot of this stuff too, is that you'll, you think like, oh, it's going to be so bad. And then you do it and you're like, oh, it's actually, it feels good to do these things. And then the more I do them, the better I feel. And then you get, then your self-esteem goes up because you're accomplishing stuff. And like you said earlier, you get stuff done and you do it at 80% because you're like, I'm going to get it done tonight. And then you're like, it wasn't that bad at 80%. And actually I'm a little bit more talented at what I just, you know, what I actually followed through on. So I'm going to be at 81%. And it's the whole thing is, it's it's a it's an amazing like again this this is something we didn't talk about either, much earlier but the self esteem aspect of this I mean you can procrastinate because of low self esteem but by not procrastinating you can actually build self esteem which makes not procrastinating even easier in the future so it's like a yeah. the whole thing is a win win if you can get the like you said earlier get that ball moving you know yeah it's like all about developing your personal power and it's like a muscle it's that. And it's not like the drill sergeant, you know, because it's not like you you have this yourself who doesn't want to do stuff. And then you've got this other part that doesn't exist that's like outside of yourself that's making you do things you don't want to do. No, it's that's that's not the way to think about it. The way to think about it is you are your own sovereign being. You're making these decisions based on your choice. You're saying, I choose to do this in my life. And then, you know, I choose to not go on Facebook as a personal challenge, you know, and then, or something like that. And and you feel stronger to do that. Like you accomplish it and you feel stronger rather than feeling like you are like being told, you're telling yourself not to do it. And you're trying to resist because what you naturally will want to do is rebel. And, you know, you don't, you don't want to use your rebellion. Um, yeah. You want to exercise your personal power. So it, it just feels so much more like this is my conscious choice. I'm not going to try to re- I'm not resisting Facebook, but mm-hmm. I'm, that's yeah. exactly it. Don't use that willpower to resist something. Use it to establish your personal, your self control. That's it. Uh, yeah, I, yeah. That's choice. That that, yeah. that little difference there of perception goes a long way. Yes. I mean, a lot of these things too. You can you can back me up here. It's hard to listen to someone tell you to do it or to read about it. It's like you and you really do have to do these things because you do them and you're like. Oh, this does feel good. You know what I mean? And you won't, you, you, it's, it's like, you can't, you can't intellectual, intellectualize it. You have to, you have to, you know, put, set that challenge up for yourself. Say, Hey, I'm going to do it for 30 days. That, that's, that's where my willpower is going to go is to make this happen. 
as best as I can do it for 30 days. And I think if you do it, it'll, it'll, it'll feel so good that you'll, you'll want to continue, you know? Yeah. You don't get stronger in the powers part by thinking about it. <laughs> you get stronger by practicing it. You get stronger by doing it. You know, that's like, I'm going to try to work my work out and get strong by reading all about working out and getting strong. <laughs> right. I mean, it, you're, you're, that's a procrastination tactic. It's like, I mean, sure, I love reading about the things that I'm doing. I love reading about meditation, but ultimately to be, to, you're not going to get any benefit on meditation unless you meditate. So just sit down and do it. And you know what I mean? And that's the, the hardest part is getting started. So that, that great, that advice of just get started is basically the cure to procrastination. I mean, just start the, the tiniest morsel and all these little tricks and tools we do are just little, techniques to help you get started the 80 percent rule it just lowers the bar so you feel like well i could do 80 percent. and then when you get started you know mike you're gonna go more than 80 percent, most likely because when you get into it you get into it you know well, i'm not gonna mow 80 percent of my lawn <laughs> right well and i totally agree <laughs> but i think it's really important to have it has to and i was i forget where i was reading this but it's really important that you have to have the it has to you in in your head you have to go it's okay. I, you literally can walk away from something. So you can say getting started is the only thing you have to do. So if you want to just put on your, your shoes and walk out the front door to the sidewalk and then come back into the house and not actually go for the walk, that's okay. Your goal should only be to get to the sidewalk for the walk. Mm -hmm. Because yeah. if you really believe, like going back to what you said, if you believe that you have to do the walk, then it's this external thing that's, that's, you know, you're you're at the whim of it. Has to be your choice. So, but I there's just nobody that's no nobody's going to put on their clothes, get to the park and go. Okay, I'm just going to go home. So, like, the, when you do these things, you'll slowly realize. Like, because look, the, the one thing is, like, it's actually funny thinking about all this stuff because I think about myself. You know, two three years ago before I got deep into this stuff, and I wasn't like this at all. You know, and now I'm like. No, I, I I look forward to doing all these things that I before thought I would never never even cons couldn't even envision myself doing it you know once let alone like looking forward to doing it every day you know so you have to you have to it has to be something that you you establish and I think establishing it with that that safety valve of saying you, you can walk away from it after eighty percent that that's a huge part of it because it has to be a choice. Yeah. And you can even give yourself permission. I mean, you should give yourself permission to walk away from it without even starting and knowing that you're going to, you're going to deal with the consequence. So, you know, you could say, you know what, I can, I'm going to totally bail on this task. I'm not even going to do it. And here's the consequence. I'm, am I capable of handling that consequence? That's something I want to deal with, you know, or if I, anything like that. And you can, so you have the, then you're choosing between the consequence and your, and your intended goal. And then with that perspective, you're more likely to say, you know what, I'm going to choose to do it because I really want to. It's getting back to that actual desire of doing it rather than the obligation to do it. Right. And that's, I mean, because that's the big, big key for a lot of this stuff is don't, you know, don't spend the willpower or try to establish somebody who is a resistor. Oh, I'm not, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to avoid Facebook. It's like, I'm a person who chooses not to use Facebook. I don't, and I, and that can apply to anything. It's, I love that. It's, don't be the resistor. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, it's, that's, good, that's, it, a, that's a really good perspective. It's a, it's a, it's a small distinction, but I would, you know, and, and again, this, this comes from, from reading a lot on these, on these kind of topics mostly from, you know, these science guys, but it's like a lot of people, they're like, oh, I'm going to not eat that, that next brownie. But it's like, no, I'm going to be the, per I'm going to establish myself as the person who chooses not to do those things. Or I'm going to be the person who chooses to go for a walk when I have that urge. So there's not even brownies around me. So, you know what I mean? There's, there's things that you can do to, to that don't, don't even have to involve the thing that you want to not do. So if you don't want to, you know, like, oh, I got to, I got to exercise more. I mean, that one's obviously a choice, but the things that you need to, you want to not do, such as spend time on social media or, you know, eating yeah. poorly. Well, you reckon, you, as you become a person who does things, you start to recognize the things that hold you back. And for when I started working for myself, I had goals and desires that I really wanted to get done. And then when I realized I didn't have anyone else to blame, 
I saw where every, where I was getting distracted and pulled in directions that prevented, that took me off my path, that prevented me from doing what I wanted, that I set out to do. And those are the things that it's like, look, I need to put my foot down and say, no, I am not doing it, or I'm only going to do it when I, when I want to, genuinely want to. I'm not going to let it unconsciously control me. And and that that type of power is this amazing personal power that you can develop but it starts off waking one small willpower decision at a time like like george and i were talking about is this type of personal power doesn't come tomorrow it's not going to be as easy but like you can make these small little decisions to become a person who makes the bed every morning and and adds these new habits and stuff like that and you overcome procrastination one little task at a time if you just make a conscious choice to say i'm going to do it instead of not do it then you have overcome procrastination. It doesn't matter the quality of the output of the work that you do after that point. And so that's a good point. You get into the habit of of recognizing you have a choice. I can quit. I can go forward. And if you choose to go forward, that's the hardest part. You just overcame procrastination. You can check that off your habits. You can count yourself as a success. You just built a muscle and cellular memory of getting past that resistance. And that's where you start to build the momentum of this amazing personal power that allows you basically do whatever the heck you want and create the life that you want ultimately. Yeah. That's, and that's a, that's a great point of the, um, you know, once you've overcome that resistance, then you've succeed. Like that's the success right there. The success is that you got that you didn't let it get, get to you. Everything after that is a bonus. Yeah. Like going to the gym, doesn't matter what you do at the gym. The hardest, you know, the hardest part is getting your shoes on and getting in the car and going to the gym. That's the hardest part. So do do that. You know, so when you have to study and you know, you got a test coming up and you've got, you got eight, 18 weeks or whatever until the test and you know, you want to put it off to the last week or the last night, you know, why are you going to do that? Like you you've been thinking about it this whole time, every single night I should study. I should study. I should do this. I should do my homework. I should do this, te- do this, but I don't feel like I'm going to play Xbox. Don't play Xbox or, or play Xbox, but just start on the studying thing. Do it for five minutes. Overcome that resistance. And you'll get you'll get so much better at it, and you'll and you'll stop beating yourself up about the whole I procrastinate too much. I'm not getting anything done on my goals. You're gonna stop beating yourself up because you're gonna start to see positive positive results like right off the bat. Like you know what, I overcame procrastination today. Like I'm I'm pretty I'm pretty good for today. Oh, I did yesterday. I've got three days in a row where I felt like I made that choice. I'm doing pretty good. And you just start to feel this insane self esteem boost. Well the the the, the big thing that you start noticing is you start seeing like, oh yeah, that all those things I claimed I wanted to do were things to avoid doing what i really wanted to do and then once you're doing what you really want to do you're like i don't want to do that you know you don't need video games and television and junk food and all these other things they will be far less compelling when you're actually getting some stuff done and moving forward on the things that you want to do because you're like oh yeah that was a hundred percent to avoid you know having to, uh, to confront this stuff and then once you're confronting it you're like it's not that big of a deal it's actually kind of fun, and I kind of like doing this more than that. You don't; those things just they be. You don't need to resist them anymore. They're just they, they just. Yes. You can still go and do them. I mean, I still sit around and watch. I mean, I watch some shows here and there. I mean, it's not like I don't do any of that stuff anymore. But it's like you see it for what it is. You're like, oh, I was totally, totally using that, so I could have. Because then, what you, you know, there's a, an, an insidious thing that's going on too that I've noticed is that part of the procrastination is definitely some self esteem stuff. But if you procrastinate, then you can go. Well, I suck. So, eh, you know what? I'm not really a motivated person. I'm never going to really do that stuff. You know what I mean? And you can start, what you're doing is you're creating a excuse for you to put yourself down and to be a person who doesn't get things done so that you don't have to do them later. So that you can, again, avoid the confrontation of the result or the judgment or whatever. But you that's part of the reason you need to overcome that initial procrastination because what you're doing you know you're just feeding into this this negative mindset that is going to because what you're it's like a bank account for the future procrastination you know what i mean so it's like your procrastination now makes you feel bad so that later on you're like yeah whatever i'm not i kind of screwed up yesterday anyway so i'm just not going to do it now so and i think you under the but down deep down inside you know you're doing that you know you're setting yourself up for an excuse to back out of it later on. And the every that's why it's important to, you know, to do it every single try to every day, just to overcome a little bit of, you know, just get started every single day because you'll you'll establish the fact that you don't do those things anymore. And you're not mm-hmm. the kind of person that says that you know, puts it off. 
yeah, I mean, the best thing, this is one of the things I always recommend is the whole wake up early or wake up when your alarm goes off habit. Like, don't start the day with a procrastination habit of hitting the snooze. <laughs> Like when you hit snooze, you just initially initiated your day with a procrastination habit. (laughs) And that's probably the worst thing you could do. I mean, you've probably always done it. So you don't, I mean, if you're a kind of person who hits snooze, I mean, you, when was the last time you didn't hit snooze and jumped right out of bed? I mean, if you've done it all the time, you don't even really know what it's like to not do it. But I, but believe me, when you start a wake up early habit, 30 to 60 minutes, and then you make that about doing small little habits every single day. Like make your bed, meditate for five minutes, write in your journal. Um, yeah, those little things, you start to be like, holy crap, I am, I can do this stuff. And, and that, that helps you get over procrastination the rest of the day. You start off with a bunch of little small successes and that's like so key. And it, ta- and it takes your, it gives you your power back of your life. And, you know, when, like George, you said, when you play that Xbox or, or go on Facebook for too long. And you're like regretting it. Whenever you feel regret for doing these little things that are just numbingly entertaining and, you know, and watching that fourth episode of the TV series in a row and knowing you're procrastinating and you just can't find the motivation to do it. You're building the habit of powerlessness and you'll, I mean, the human race is so immediately so intensely powerful, but we're, we have so much distraction and so many things kind of in our way that we defeat ourselves. We just allow it to happen by not saying no and not saying and not putting our conscious intention to create what we want. We end up just succumbing to whatever, you know, the society wants us to be, you know, they, we, a consumer and enter, entertained to death or playing that next video game. You know, it's like we just end up in this default lifestyle and we're never going to create what we want unless we take our power back. Amen. And so, yeah, wake up early. Take that power back by just starting up, getting carving out time before anyone else is awake. If you if you if you live with other people, and uh, do a bunch of those things in the beginning of the day, your first hour of the day should be like your your power hour or something like that. Is that what Tony Robbins calls it? I don't know. I haven't, I haven't read his book, but I mean, yeah. And then the rest of your day is like gravy, you know, because you just you already did something awesome. Right. Right. I mean, it's 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 all about that. It's a chain of those habits, man, because you just, that, that was one of the things that he touched in, touched on in that, uh, that book called the happy, uh, is it called happiness hypothesis? Yeah. yeah so he, he called it. He, maybe you've heard this before, but the, the, the analogy of the elephant and the rider, you heard this one about the mind? No, I'm not sure. Well, the idea is like basically that, that our conscious, you know, self-aware mind is the rider on an elephant, which is the body and the, the emotions and the, you know, the, the, the ancient part of the brain. So it's like the, 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 the conscious the human, you know, homo sapiens, you know, self-aware, that part of the brain is like this tiny part that's riding on this huge, huge elephant that doesn't really, that's not very smart at all. And the elephant goes where it wants to, you can make decisions or suggestions and try to steer it. But it's really, if, it, if the elephant freaks out, it's going to take off in the direction that it wants to. And I think, it's a really interesting way to look at your, you know, a lot of these things. And yeah. you said earlier about building these habits and, and doing, you know, the starting off the day, right. It's, it's basically like, you know, you're training, you're training your body and your, the parts of your brain that have been established for, you know, millennia to be, you know, to do things that aren't necessarily the most productive in, in modern society or modern civilization. So it's like, you realize like, no, nope, these little tricks, like they sound like they're not even tricks. They're just like, they literally are like, you know, if you want to train a dog to do certain things or certain techniques that just work, you know, and it's the same, our body, our nervous system, our, our endocrine system, our emotions, all of these biochemical processes that go on have a certain, there's certain things that just, that's just how they work. And you can't, I mean, that's one of the things you get into with like willpower and, and those kind of, uh, you know, those, the science behind that stuff is that they're, they're not talking about, psychological tricks these are literally biological tricks or biological systems that this is how the body works you just have to learn to work around them you know so one of them is the, re- the repetition and to, to, to face the fear and, and move on and to like you said earlier to, to start the day off right don't start, like don't start off with the snooze bar like that's the, the, the most widespread procrastination that there is so you can yeah. get your body used to your brain and your nervous system and your emotions used to like, no, this is just what we do, you know? So 
Yeah. It's like that dog that's anxious for you to come home when it hears your here's your car drive up. Like your body will start and your mind will start getting anxious to do these things when it knows it's time to do them. So Yeah, and speaking of the elephant, I have another analogy. It's like we human beings are like this elephant in the circus that's like tied to a little pole by a tiny little rope and it believes that it's tied there. It, it believes that it can't go out past the little you know, the ring. It's so it's so trained. It doesn't actually realize how powerful it is, and until it like wakes up and realizes its true power. I mean, it, otherwise, it's just like a it's an entertainment. It's a slave. It's a little you know. It's 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 a circus animal. You know, it's not a true raw powerful elephant like in in the wild. So we don't want to be that. We don't want. We we need to sever that little little tiny cord that binds us to our helplessness. You know and like just doing these little habits each day is is a perfect way to do it. So George, what do you, do you got anything else on procrastination? Got any resources for, for people out there? Well, I mean, we've mentioned the, 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 the podcast, uh, the guy, the scientist who does, who runs that is his name is Timothy Pitchell. And it's spelled really weird, like P Y C H Y L I think, but uh, the name of the podcast is I procrastinate and it's like the, you know, like the iMac, I procrastinate. Yeah. So obviously he's been around for a while, <laughs> for a while. Yeah. His website <laughs> is a little old school. Yeah. But he's, he's a really, seems like a really nice guy. And he really has a lot of super interesting guests on there, other scientists and lots of really interesting information. So definitely that's number one. And then, um, and it's especially because it's a podcast because you can listen to it when you're driving. And like you said, you can listen to it while you're not procrastinating. So, and that's what I used to do. I, when I, I would listen to it while I was exercising or trying to get some stuff done. I'm like, this is a good way to motivate myself. But um, yeah. the one book that I found, also found that really kind of opened up the connection between at least, you know, again, and this may be a little bit more particular for me, but um, I think it will resonate with a lot of people. Um, with the perfectionism and the procrastination, the book was called uh, Seven Secrets of the Prolific. And you wouldn't think it was a procrastination or a perfectionism book. And it really kind of isn't. It, that wasn't the focus. It was a woman who was a writer. And the book was about how to get more writing done. And it was a really good book on any creativity or any from any creative pursuit, how to, you know, get focused and, and, and accomplish something. Mm-hmm. And, uh, but she, some of her chapters in there on, on perfectionism and procrastination were so good uh, and opened my eyes up to a lot of stuff that I really, even if you're not a creative person, I think that you will get a lot out of what her, and her book was super cheap. I think it was like, I mean, unless it was on sale, but it was like two bucks on like the iBook store or on Kindle or something like that. So yeah, um, re- relatively inexpensive. And I don't think it was even more than six bucks total, like the full copy if you get it digital, but, um, so yeah, but if you're a creative person, I think you, you know, definitely get a lot out of it. Even if you're not, I think her chapters and, and I, uh, there's, I'll try to remember to send you links, but she's got a couple of the authors. Name is Reddig, R E T T I G Hillary Reddig. And, um, her website, which I think is Hillary com, has some pages on both procrastination and perfectionism. And then, solutions for them and then they were those are really good good overviews too because a lot of people there's a lot of people out there that might go I don't, i'm not a perfectionist you might be and you might not realize what the word actually entails so i would suggest educating yourself on the perfectionism side of things make sure that that isn't you if it's if you don't think it is just double check uh on this level and then check her book out and uh i think I think that would be, I think those would probably be the two biggest things that I think. That yeah, is. the I Procrastinate uh, podcast and then Hillary Reddick with her book, The Seven Secrets of the Prolific. I'm looking at her website right now and it's um, the definitive guide to overcoming procrastination, perfectionism, and writer's block. Oh, okay. So she does talk about it. Maybe that's why. I, I yeah, it um, sounds awesome. I mean, she's got a whole, whole site dedicated to uh, overcoming procrastination. It's really awesome. And some of my favorite resources, I mean, like I second the I procrastinate podcast, but also love the power of habit. I love, um, yeah, that was a good book too. Yeah. Yeah. That's definitely good to learning about the habit stuff and, and take a listen to back to our habits podcast. It was a couple episodes ago, you know, to kind of understand 
building these positive habits for momentum and stuff like that. And, and also The Miracle Morning, the book that really inspired me about waking up early. I probably never even started thinking about procrastination until I started waking up early and trying to establish these positive life changing habits in my life and then started realizing, wow, these are this is these are my challenges and this is how I get over it. Um, yeah. And I started feeling really good about it. And then the other book I always recommend is The War of Art by Stephen Pressfield to really get a handle on this thing we call resistance, which is closely tied to procrastination. Yeah, I can't believe I forgot about that, but that's a huge one too. And definitely the war of art and the follow up to it was also awesome. Turning pro, so yeah, turning pro and do the work. <laughs> He's got yeah, these; they're, they're really small books, so it's like really easy to read. And the chapters are super short, so you can be like, "Oh, I'm only going to read for like five minutes," and you can actually get <laughs> quite a bit out of it. Um, let's see. Do I have anything? Oh yeah, the Sean West, ninety uh, percent. So look up, look him up. He's got a procrastination episode on his podcast, the Sean West podcast. He's a creative, he's an illustrator, a letterer, an entrepreneur. So if you're, if you vibe with that sort of uh, lifestyle, he's going to be someone you want to listen to. Um, and I'm also coaching people on procrastination. So if you want to talk directly with me on coach.me, you can look me up there. The, the habit that people check into is called kill procrastination. So you can sign up for that and, um, you can just get help for free from the community, or you can hire me as a coach for that. And uh, what else? I think that's about all I can think of as far as resources go. Just get started. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's that's so much of it. And you can you can understand the fear. You can understand perfectionism and all that kind of stuff behind it. It helps if you understand the enemy. But you can avoid procrastination by eliminating distraction and just getting started. And I think you'll be on your way. Right. And I, one uh, one last thought. I think it will help too, is you may think that your procrastination is part of who you are. That's the, that's a, one of the biggest hurdles to get over is you can change these uh, habits or these uh, behaviors, these ways of thinking. Like I, I used to totally think like, I, that's just how I am. And that's, that's totally not true. So those kind of limiting beliefs can be a huge thing to realize. Like it's, if you're in the back of your head listening to this going, ah, oh, that's just not me. It, it can be if you want it to be. So that's a good, good uh, advice. It's a good way to end it. So yeah, thanks George. <laughs> that, that's an awesome thing. Yeah. It's not, it doesn't have to be who you are. Well, thanks everyone for taking another episode with George and I on the maker mistaker podcast. And you know, if you like what you hear, go to iTunes, give us a rating, write us a review, send us an email, Jeff 82 Finley at gmail.com. Love to hear what you have to say about procrastination or habits or personal development or anything like that. If you've got a resource you feel like we're missing, then definitely shoot it over to us and we'll put it in the show notes. But um, yeah, you can view the show notes on this episode at makermistaker.com. Follow me on Twitter, Jeff underscore Finley. Follow George on Twitter, which you don't really use Twitter very much, but it's at G Coghill. Um, go to his website, um, the overthinker.wordpress.com, right? Uh, no, that website is georgecoghill.wordpress.com. Georgecoghill.wordpress.com? Okay. Yeah, go to his site, read a couple of his blog posts, and send him an email if you dig what he's up to. So, um, Well, that's it for today. Thanks again for listening. And until next time, live consciously and pursue your purpose. Thank you.